Why can't women become priests? 1-833-288-EWTN. I don't understand why I have to earn salvation. 1-833-288-3986. Why do I need to confess my sins to a priest? What's stopping you? You, you? This is Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Well, a tremendous Monday to each and every one of you. I hope you all had a terrific uh, weekend this past weekend. Uh, Welcome to EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. We ask that question every day. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? The show's uh, geared primarily for our non-Catholic brothers and sisters, but anybody's welcome to call if you're in conversations with... uh, uh, one of our evangelical brothers and sisters, or maybe someone who is of no faith at all, and they've asked some questions you're having trouble with, we'd welcome that phone call from you. The number is 833-288-EWTN. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is one 205 271 and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. And you can always send us an email. That email address is ctc at ewtn.com. We always and everywhere and every day love to hear from you. We love your phone calls, but I have an ulterior motive today. It's that time of the season when the, the seasons are changing. My voice is a little dicey today as I sit in for Tom Price, whose voice is even dicier than mine. So I really want you to pick up the phone and give us a call and save my voice. As I mentioned, I am Jack Williams sitting in today for Tom Price, Charles Beery behind the glass producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Gubensky and Jeff Burson, magnificent person, is handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host is he is every day, Dr. David Andrews. How are you? Jack, I'm doing great. Thanks. How about you? I'm fantastic. We've got an email here from Pete in the great state of Washington. He says, Dr. Andrews, can you please help me respond to a friend or family member who says, I'm a spiritual person, just not religious. In other words, they believe in God and or Jesus, but don't need to go to church, any church. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So the Catholic position is that every human being uh, that is born is spiritual and not religious. We're, all of us are spiritual because we have a spiritual soul. We have an immaterial soul that's capable of spirituality, and so and we're spiritual. You might say we're biological in the same way that we're an organism. Imagine someone saying to you, I'm biological, I just don't believe in the gym, Right. I have this organism, but I don't do anything to take care of it. And that's, that's the Catholic's position, right? That we're spiritual in virtue of being spiritual creatures, but you have to do something to curate that spirituality, uh, to make something of it, to make it into a life of virtue and charity. And any old thing won't do. There is a prescription, and the pharmacist is uh, Jesus Christ, and he gives us the prescription of Catholicism to shape and conform that spirit to something beautiful, namely a life of charity and virtue. And that's that's what religion, well, revealed religion, that's what the Catholic religion is good for, literally. It's a, it's a tool created by God with divine authority to help us craft that spiritual human personality into something beautiful, namely the likeness and image of Christ. So, David, I'd like for you to comment on uh, another aspect of this question that I think as we become more isolated, especially in our culture here in the United States, becomes more and more prevalent. And that would be the notion that, you know, I, 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 hear, I hear the words of Jesus, I hear the message of the gospel, and I hear it ringing true, and it makes a lot of sense to me. But quite frankly, I'm not too keen on the whole notion of being accountable to anybody. Yes. Well, you, you know, you, you mentioned the isolation in the culture. Uh, I'm going to tie it into what I said previously about Catholicism being a divinely instituted system for improving our character and making us in Christ's likeness and image. Ch- charity is impossible in a room full of one, right? Augustine of Hippo said that God gave us the church so that we would have people to be good to, do, people to do good to. And, and so you, you can't have it both ways. You, you can't have a life of charity— and then have no one to whom you're accountable. 
Uh, anyone who's in a family knows this. I mean, I attempt to love my family. Imagine me trying to love my wife and children and yet not being accountable to them. All right, David, I'd like you to come pick the kids up after school on Friday. I'm not accountable to you. But that, it's, it's antithetical to the goal of charity. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Still a couple of open lines at 833-288-3986. Kathy writes in, I'm a single mother, and for many years I've felt that I have a calling to preach on the theology of the body. How would I get started? Um, yeah, thanks. I really appreciate the question. So uh, the first thing, most important thing to do, of course, is to familiarize yourself with the content. So study the writings of uh, St. John Paul II, study his theology of the body, study the literature about it, study the catechesis that the Church has given us, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, and so forth. Uh, really make sure you have, you're, you're a master of the material. And then uh, I would begin by sharing it in a charitable way with people that you know, right? You, you don't have to be on a stage with a microphone to be a witness for the truth of the gospel, um, and uh, and if this becomes a kind of expertise of yours and something that you're skillful at, people will take note, and and you'll be asked to share more frequently and more in, in, in different places. I mean, another rule of thumb is that when you when you, when you want to be involved in either an area of work or ministry, uh, start hanging around people that do that, and and opportunities will tend to present themselves. You know, when I got into broadcasting in high school sports. People would say to me on occasion, well, you know an awful lot about what's going on with these kids on the field and everything else. And, you know, my answer to them was I made it, I make it my business to know. And that's kind of the same thing. There huh? you go. You know, people ask yeah. me, how, Anders, how did you get involved in Catholic radio? I said, it's very simple. Get a Ph.D. in historical theology, move five miles away from the world's largest religious broadcaster, then get a job singing in the choir next to the program director's wife. <laughs> there you have it. Simple, works fit, simple every formula. every single time. <laughs> 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Leonard in Columbus, Deborah in Fairbanks, Alaska, and we've got plenty of time for your phone calls as well. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833 833- Two eight eight three nine eight six. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Give us a call and let us know at Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. This is Father Wade Menezes of the Fathers of Mercy. I'm here to take your calls on Faith, Family, and Fellowship on Open Line Tuesday, tomorrow afternoon, 3 Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Life Issues with Brad Mattis, president of Life Issues Institute. 25 years ago, embryonic stem cells made their scientific debut. It was sold as a silver bullet to curing pretty much all diseases known to mankind. Those of us who oppose killing human embryos for experimentation but supported adult stem cells were labeled science deniers and cruel for wanting to withhold these medical miracles from children plagued with illness. The money started pouring in to fund the research. Three billion tax dollars in California alone. They were so sure of themselves and sniffed at the idea adult stem cells were the promise of the future. What did the scientific elitists achieve after 25 years? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Time has proven the real science deniers were those who believed in killing human life for experimentation. Follow us on social media at Life Issues Institute. The words of blessed Carlo Acutis. Our goal must be infinite, not finite. The infinite is our homeland. Heaven has been waiting for us forever. EWTN. Eight three three two eight eight EWTN is our toll free number. Eight three three two eight eight three nine eight six. 
You know, Thursday nights are one of my favorite nights because it's the world over with Raymond Arroyo. He and his guests will tackle uh, the things going on in our culture from a Catholic perspective. Uh, I highly recommend uh, everybody check that out on Thursdays, the world over with Raymond Arroyo. And we can even send email alerts to remind you uh, about that very thing. Uh, and if you'd like to take advantage of that, simply log on to EWTN.com and click on subscriptions. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Leonard is in Columbus, Ohio, listening on St. Gabriel Radio. Leonard, you're first up today. You're on with Dr. David Andrews. Thank you, and thank you for your show. I, I love it. So my question is, uh, this past Sunday, uh, I went to care with my family, and my daughter, who says is married uh, in a court and now pregnant with her child, uh, she went to communion, and then I, I, I was confused. So when we got home, I asked her that didn't she know she had to be married in the church to be able to go to communion? And then she said uh, she has spoken with two priests, and they said it was okay. So I said, okay, maybe I got it wrong. So I'll find out more. And okay, that's yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the question. So I, I, I take it that when your daughter got married, that she was a Catholic at the time. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so uh, according to the Code of Canon Law, now I'm looking at the canons right now, Canon 1108 and following, a, the only valid marriage for a Catholic is one that's contracted before the bishop or a priest or a deacon, unless the person receives a dispensation from the bishop to dispense from what's called canonical form. I am assuming your daughter did not receive a dispensation from the bishop. I can't imagine that she would be granted one to marry before a justice of the peace. And so the church regards her marriage as invalid for lack of form. So it's not a valid marriage. Um, that would be an impediment to her going to communion. Fortunately, it's easy to fix. All she has to do is repeat her vows in the presence of a Catholic priest, she and her husband, and they can regularize their marriage, and she can be restored to fellowship with the church. So your intuition was correct. Um, I, you know, I hate to say it, but you, you can find a priest who will justify anything that you want justified, right? So the fact that some pastor says something— um, is not a definitive ruling on the content of the Catholic faith or its canon law or its catechism. Um, and I'm surprised that she found two to say that, but it's not, it's not totally beyond the pale to imagine some Catholic priests give bad counsel. Some do, right? Um, and so they were incorrect. And uh, if she married outside the church, her marriage is invalid, and she needs to fix that, but it's easily fixable. Thanks, Leonard. We appreciate the phone call. We'll keep you and your daughter and her husband in our prayers. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. Still have half the op half of the lines are open for you at 833-288-3986. Deborah is a first-time caller in Fairbanks, Alaska, listening on iHeartRadio. Deborah, you're on with Dr. David Andrews. Hi, good morning, Dr. David Anders, and uh, thank you so much uh, for taking my call and for doing this show. Um, uh, I, I'm calling because uh, of my, uh, well, I, I'm grieving the loss of my mother. I just laid her to rest last Monday. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you. And our family is is a bit fragmented, and um, she was the matriarch and the uh, spiritual leader. Um, and so uh, I'm just having um, trouble communing with my own family because you were talking about charity starts in your own family. And and we're very, um, I'm the only Catholic. Uh, I'm one of the only Christians. And uh, so it, I haven't had a lot of good communication uh, with my family through this and I don't know how to support them or myself through this. Um. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you, Deborah. First of all, let me say I'm I am really, really, really sorry for your loss, and uh, I 
I, I feel it deeply along with you. Um, I lost a parent who was just the most precious person in the world to me a couple of years ago, and I still grieve. So I and and he had a similar role in my family, and I I think I understand what you're going through, and you really have my deepest sympathy. Um, first of all, it's very natural I think that you would feel these ways. Uh, uh, you know, grief brings out a lot of complications in our lives that we don't anticipate before the grief sets in. Um, I know it happened to me. We start second guessing ourselves in our relationships, maybe past decisions, and so forth. I think all that's part of the grieving process, and uh, so I would. I certainly don't have any kind of negative judgment about anything that you've told me at all, and I, I really hope that you won't judge yourself negatively. If you feel like you're having trouble with your siblings, I, that's probably I mean, it's not your fault. Um, you're not responsible, and uh, and you know the, the the weight of your emotional response has nothing to do with the question of your moral responsibility, right? It's it's reasonable for you to feel pain. That doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. So so give yourself a break, and I know that's hard to do. Um, but uh, like I said, I think this is all part of the grieving process. When it comes to the actual theology of your question, and that is, what are my moral obligations towards people that are difficult to get along with, people that don't share my Catholic faith? Here, I think theology is very helpful to us, right? Because love is not a sentiment. Catholic faith does not teach that love is a sentiment. It's not an emotion. It's not something that that we feel like we feel anger or, or hunger or fear, or something like that. It's not that kind of thing. Um, love is compatible with a lot of different emotions. It's compatible with joy and sorrow and fear and anger. All these are compatible with the experience of love. Love is really not in the emotions. It's in the will. It's in the determination of the will. And what exactly are we called to determine? What are we called to decide if we are charitable? Two things. One of them is benevolence. We, to love someone is to want the good for them. Now, um, you, that doesn't mean wanting what they want for themselves. You know, if, you're, if you care for someone who's involved in an activity that is harmful to them, the loving thing is to want them not to be in that activity. Right? So you don't have to agree with them to love them. Secondly, we, we, we ought to desire some sort of union with them, but not any kind of union. Not any kind of union but a union in the good. So let, let's take, for example, I don't know what your relatives are up, but I'll take a, let's take an extreme example. Let's say that you have an, uh, a relative that's an addict, and, and the only way that they want to be around you is to, say, talk about their addiction and their immoral behavior. Well, you're under no obligation to bond with them over that kind of activity. So it's a willingness to be in union with them, but only in the good, which means a union in virtue. And so if there's no good thing that they're willing to share with you, you're, you have no obligation, right? Except, except like just the general benevolence. And so the way you do that is you keep a door open. You keep a door open, um, but, uh, but, but you're only going to fellowship when there's some positive good that you can share. It. Like I have relatives... Um, you know, with basically we can talk about movies, right? I mean, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a movie as such. It's a good thing that we can have communion about. But there are whole areas of life we don't have communion. That's okay. That's not on you. You're not responsible for their moral choices. Just be benevolent towards them in your heart, wishing what's best for them, genuinely best, like in God's eyes, what's best for them, and be willing to be in union with them insofar as that's possible in some legitimately good thing. And, and the, the more each person embraces the life of virtue, the greater the scope or possibility for that union to develop and, and to become something better. But, that, but again, that takes two people, and you're only responsible for your own life of virtue, not for theirs. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Aubrey in Detroit, Michigan, watching us on EWTN Television today. Aubrey, you're on with Dr. David Anders. Good afternoon, Tom and Dr. Um, Anders. How you doing? Fine, thank you. How about you? All right. In no way, shape, form am I I'm, I'm contemplating a suicide. But I wanted to know, because somebody asked me, why does God don't forgive for suicide, and if any special event that suicide occurs is it a is it is it uh 
Uh, is it excusable if I'm making sense? And do we know of any saints that went to heaven and came back and talked about it, if you if that makes sense, yeah, Dr. Anders? Yeah, sure. I know exactly what you're saying. I'm, I'm trying to find the passage in the Catechism right now while we're talking about this. Okay, uh, I'm just going to share with you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, you know, suicide contradicts the natural inclination of human beings to preserve and perpetuate life, and it's gravely contrary to the just love of self. All right, so so intrinsically, suicide is an intrinsically immoral activity, in the same way that murder is, because you're you're seeking positively to do harm to someone um, whose life has value in God's eyes. Now that being said, Catechism goes on to say grave psychological disturbances. Anguish or, ang anguish or grave fear or hardship, suffering or torture can diminish the responsibility of the one committing suicide, and therefore we should not despair of the eternal salvation of persons who have taken their own lives. By ways not only to him, God can provide the opportunity for salutary repentance. All right, so anyways, let me boil that down. It's intrinsically wrong to kill yourself. It doesn't mean that every person who commits suicide is fully morally responsible for their action. Because many times, of course, they are out of their right mind. I mean, quite literally, they're through through grief or or crushing depression or loss. Um, they may they may lose their reason, lose their capacity to really decide between good and evil. And the church does not see such situations as ones in which people are fully morally responsible for their actions. So we don't ever say of someone who dies by suicide, well, we know that they're in hell because they committed suicide. No, we don't know that. We 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 can't know that. And we entrust them to the mercy of God. Now we don't we don't know that they're in heaven either, but we know that God loves all and desires all to be saved. Right. So we 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 tell people don't commit suicide. It is intrinsically wrong. You shouldn't do it. But if someone does, we don't despair of their salvation. As far as the question, are there any saints who have gone to heaven and maybe met suicides and come back and told us about it? The the, the only anecdote that I know somewhat related to that was the case of a woman who approached Padre Pio, who was a celebrated visionary and seemed to see and know a lot of things that most people couldn't know, um, and, uh, and mentioned a relative of hers who had died by suicide by leaping off of a bridge. And she asked Padre Pio if this relative was in heaven or hell. And Padre Pio went to prayer, and he came back a few minutes later and said, basically, he repented on the way down. And he made it to heaven. Now, that's an anecdote. It's a private revelation. Can you put stock in that? You know, that it's not the church's public teaching that that particular soul is in heaven. Uh, but uh, Padre Pio, you know, has a pretty wide following among among those devoted to him. And uh, many, including some popes, have put stock in some of his uh, some of his uh, private revelations. So I just give you to that. Give that to you for your own consideration. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Wide open phone lines for you at 833-288-3986. Carol writes in, I always thought the words, do this in remembrance of me, meant receiving the body and blood of Jesus. Can you help me understand this? Um, yeah, well, you're, you're not altogether wrong there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so so the, the, the command, do this in memory of me, really is a command about the, the entire rite of the Mass. So that is, from beginning to end, that, that's the whole celebration that took place on Holy Thursday in the Upper Room. Um, all the prayers, all the parts of the Mass, and especially the consecration, the sacrifice, and the communion, all are implicated in Christ's command that we do this in memory of Him. Now, um, the, the, the phrase, do this in memory of me, is interesting because it can be taken in several ways. Uh, one of them is just the bare act of recalling something to mind, and that's clearly in view. It's not the only thing in view. It's clearly in view, and we use that language in the Mass itself when we say that this is the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection. So every time Mass is celebrated in, in, uh, in the Holy Catholic Church, we see in the ritual the death of Christ on Calvary is presented before us in a symbolic form. Now, I didn't say the Eucharist was symbolic. I said the rite is symbolic. Through the double consecration of bread and wine, represented Christ in a state of victimhood, we are able to recall what happened on Calvary as we represent the true victim on the altar. So there is a memorial aspect in the sense of calling things to mind. Um, there's another aspect of the word uh, in memory of me. The, the Greek word there, I won't go and bore you with Greek details, but the Greek word there um, 
is is used one other place in the New Testament, in Acts chapter ten, when uh, when Peter is sent to the to the Roman centurion Cornelius, because uh, Cornelius has a vision, and in that vision, he's a pagan, he's a he's a Gentile. An angel appears to him and says, "Cornelius, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up before God as a memorial offering. A memorial offering." a kind of offering, a kind of sacrifice. And therefore, since you have favor with God, go send to the sky Peter, and he'll tell you the way to be saved. And so the same word that's translated as memory has strong overtones in the Jewish sacrificial system with a sacrifice called the memorial offering. And, and that, that helps us to see some biblical logics, one of the many arguments you could bring to bear, on the church's teaching that the rite itself, that the sacrifice of the Mass, is in fact a sacrificial act. It, it, it recalls not only the death of Christ on Calvary, but also a form of sacrifice embedded in Jewish ritual. 833-288-EWTN. Still a couple of open lines at 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's call to communion with Dr. David Anders. November is the month of all souls, and we pray for the souls of all the faithful departed in purgatory. Many of the saints speak of our prayers for the dead as being something they really need and can benefit from. Tradition says, though the dead in purgatory can pray for us, they cannot pray for themselves, and they very much need our prayers. Throughout this month of November and throughout our lives, we owe the deceased our prayers. Join in this devotion to all souls with books for children and adults, crucifixes, prayer cards, and DVDs available at EWTNRC.com. Christ is the Answer with Father John Ricardo. Here's the new challenge. At least one hour a week in front of the Blessed Sacrament with the goal of an hour a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I had a guy come up to me and he says, Father, you know, I'm doing a lot of things. I'm, I'm in a men's fellowship. I pray with my wife every day. I go to mass every Sunday and, and usually a couple times during the week. I read scripture. He goes, I want more. I said, do you pray in front of the Blessed Sacrament? He said, outside of mass, no. I said, I think that's the more. See, all these saints, these are the ones who surround us. These are the ones who ran before us. These are the ones who fought well, who kept the faith. They would tell you, as would every single saint in heaven right now, you cannot run this race if you don't spend time with the master. Whatever else we're doing, it's second, third, and fourth. First things need to be first. And the first thing is to be with the master. And the master is Jesus. Hi, this is Janet Williams. You don't have to be a woman to enjoy Women of Grace tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern here on EWTN Radio. Now back to Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders. What's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Give us a call and let us know at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Next stop for us is Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Andrew is listening on Guadalupe Radio. Andrew, you're on with Dr. David Anders. Hi, appreciate the show. Um, Yesterday, my wife and I were... um, walking about in a mall and someone said, Hey, we're going to have a prayer service. Are you interested? I said, I'm interested, but unfortunately we don't have time right now. And I believe they said they were part of the grace church, which I don't know where they came from, et cetera, but uh, said here, let me show you a passage where it talks about, did you know the church had another bride other than the lamb because the lamb is God or is Christ, but there's another bride. And I said, okay, that's, I let them talk a bit. And they mention how the Sabbath is on Catholics are wrong because we go to church on the wrong day and then brought up, well, all the errors started with Constantine. I asked, were they familiar with church fathers prior to 300? No. Are they familiar with the catechism? No. Invited them to go to RCIA. But I wondered if you're familiar with the Grace Church and this uh, idea that 
Yes. Like yes, thank you. I appreciate the question. So first of all, with, with respect to the Grace Church, um, that's kind of like asking a Catholic if he's ever heard of a parish named after the Blessed Virgin Mary, right? There, there are probably a million parishes in the world with that name, and to try to differentiate them, it would be impossible. The number of Protestant congregations that have grace in their name is, uh, is uh, nigh unto infinite, so it would be very difficult for me to locate pre precisely this one congregation or group. Uh, but in terms of their doctrine, of course, I've heard that teaching. Uh, it's, it's characteristic of Seventh-day Adventists uh, and others as well. Um, and the, the, the claim is, I mean, I hate to say it, it's just abysmally ignorant. I mean, the claim that Constantine changed the day of Christian worship or, or, or that this was a kind of violation of New Testament principles or something is uh, very, very, very grossly ignorant. So within the New Testament itself, there's clear indications that the celebration of the Lord's Day on the eighth day, the first day of the week, had become the norm. So two places, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and, and 1 Corinthians 16, um, we read that it's on the first day of the week that the, that the church would gather, uh, celebrate the Eucharist, and, and make their offerings for the poor. So that's, that's within the New Testament. Our very earliest uh, writings outside the New Testament also indicate that this is the practice. So I'm talking about the Didache, the Letter of Barnabas, the, the, the Epistles of Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, uh, first century, very early second century Christian writers um, from various parts of the empire all recognize that, that the Christian practice is to gather together to celebrate the day of the Lord, the day of his resurrection, on the eighth day of the first day of the week. Um, so it, it, for, it, the idea that this somehow happened in the 4th century is just insane. I mean, that they, they haven't read the text. They don't know the history. Uh, but more to the theology of the thing. When, when people make the charge that Christians have moved the Sabbath, they, they don't understand that within the New Testament itself is emphatic that Christians are not Sabbatarians. We don't worship on the Sabbath. Like, we don't celebrate the Jewish Sabbath. I mean, the book of Colossians is explicit. Do not let anybody judge you with respect to a new moon or a Sabbath day. These things are a mere shadow of what is to come. Uh, Christians are not Jews, and we don't follow Jewish law. We don't have to. And we haven't touched the Sabbath. The Sabbath is where it is, has always been, which is Saturday, and that's when Jews go to the synagogue and refrain from work. And you'll note that something very, very different happens on Sunday. The command in the Old Testament was not gather once a week to worship. The Old Testament command was refrain from work one day a week, the seventh day of the week, and worship every day. So Jewish priests, uh, he, Israelite priests, offered sacrifice to God seven days a week. But one day a week they took off from work. Nothing in the Sabbath commandment about worship. The Christian celebration of Sunday as the Lord's Day is specifically a commemoration of his death and resurrection. It is a form of worship and for the offering of a unique sacrifice, namely the sacrifice of the Mass. That's not indicated in the Sabbath commandment. That is a new thing. Now, is there continuity between the Jewish Sabbath and Christian Sunday? Of course there is. Of course there is. So the Christian position is it's the fulfillment of the Sabbath. But we didn't move the Sabbath. We left it right where it was. And, and uh, we don't celebrate it. And we haven't, we haven't changed it. We, haven't, we, haven't, we have no problem. If Jews won't worship on the Sabbath. Fine with us. Like, refrain from work. That's great. No problems. Right? We offer the sacrifice of the Mass, the Eucharist, on Sunday. That's what Christians do. It's not the same thing as the Sabbath commandment, although it is a kind of fulfillment of the Sabbath commandment, uh, but a fundamentally different sacrifice. So theologically, your new friend's allegations misunderstand the nature of Christian worship, uh, what happens on the first day of the week, and historically, they're just way off base having not actually looked at the sources themselves to determine what is the history of this thing. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Steve is up next, a first-time caller in Mobile, Alabama listening to the College of Communion podcast. Steve, you're on with Dr. David Anders. Okay, Jack, I told the call screener I am not a first-time caller. I've called a number of times. So uh, anyway, uh, I have accolades for the show. It's like I consider myself a charter listener. When David first uh, got Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m., I was listening to EWTN on WNGL. And uh, so I've listened for a long time. And uh, I've heard a lot of what he says over and over again. So one day I'm riding. I've worked for a company that, that's statewide, and I was in the Magic City up your way. And my coworker, who didn't know any Catholics, asked me uh, why we worshipped Mary 
and believed in purgatory. And so I gave her an answer in line with the sort of thing David talked about. And uh, she was absolutely floored by that and said, you know, I've never heard anything like that. It makes perfect sense. So she got very interested in learning more about the Catholic Church. And in that study, one of the hang-ups, of course, she goes to a church up there, SMIC, let's just say that. So soteriology. Well, one morning when I was exercising and listening to my podcast, David just nailed the difference between uh, the Catholic and um, the Calvinist view of that, the soteriology. And so I referred her to that, and then all of a sudden she became interested in called a communion, and she called more than once, and one of the complaints she uh, she told David about was she didn't know any Catholics in Birmingham. And one of the people that he put her on was someone uh, David talks about frequently, and that's Father Lambert Greenan. And so she went to Father Lambert for uh, – for catechesis on the Eucharist, and that's where I met him and uh, Father Lambert was at um, Casa Maria there in his apartment. So I was actually at Casa Maria the last couple of weeks uh, at a silent Carmelite retreat, and uh, Mother asked, have you ever been here before? And uh, so I explained this to her, and uh, so it brought back a lot of good memories. And I found out later that day that this person, Elizabeth, a daughter actually became a Catholic at St. Paul that very Sunday. Uh, and also this past Sunday, November 12th, was the sixth anniversary of her becoming a Catholic church. So uh, there were a lot of other factors that were in this. I was just a minuscule part, but uh, uh, certainly this show was very, very uh, instrumental in her becoming a Catholic. So. Thank you. Wow, I I really profoundly appreciate the call, and and you're you, you you're making the goosebumps jump out on my arms when you're talking about Lambert and his connection to the show and to my life. Uh, you know, just to say a word about Lambert Green and while I'm in the air, because I want to. Um, uh, I met Father Lambert Green and oh I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. I was going to mass at Casa Maria Convent and Retreat House, and um, noticed there was this elderly, you know. 80-year-old, 80-something-year-old Dominican priest, Irish Dominican, who who seemed to live there. and didn't know his story, but he was there every week and, and uh, learned that he'd worked at the Vatican. He was the former editor of Le Servitore Romano, the Pope's newspaper, under three popes, Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, and had been there forever. And uh, my wife said, you know, you got to get to know that guy. He, he probably has some stories to tell. And, uh, and I did. I, I, they, I found out he was blind. He'd lost his eyesight and that um, he liked for people to come read to him. And so I went out to volunteer to read, and we never made it through one book. Uh, we started a book on the reform of the liturgy and uh, found out we had a lot in common, a lot of common interests. We put the book aside and started talking and began a friendship that lasted until he died, which was um, in 2018. He died at the age of 101. And uh, I, I learned more from that man than you can possibly imagine. He, he, he knew he wanted to be a Dominican priest from the age of seven years old. Um, became a Dominican at age 16. I think he was ordained in his early 20s, and uh, and you know died. He'd been 85 years in the Dominican order when he died, and had served in the Vatican under three popes. And he used to tip his hat every day to Cardinal Ratzinger on his way into the Vatican to St. Peter's. So he knew everybody in the church. He knew everything about its history in t- inside and out. Um, he could tell stories about growing up in Ireland in the you know 1920s. That, that I mean, who has that experience today? Of course, no one. Uh, but beyond all that, and though he was a tremendous intellect, he was fluent in Latin and Italian and German and deeply learned and had a, a mind like a steel trap, could remember everything, could remember lectures he heard at the Angelicum, you know, in the 1940s. Um, but above and beyond all that, he was charitable. And St. Paul says we can have wisdom and knowledge like the angels, and if we lack charity, we're, we're nothing at all. And, uh, but he was deeply charitable. And he loved me and became a very good, dear friend of mine, always cared about me as a human being, not just about my mind or my catechesis or theology, but about my wife, my children, my family, my life, my parents, my sufferings, my sorrows, my hopes and dreams, and, uh, and generally mentored me and was to me the face of Christ in, in his mercy, uh, you know, with a very Dominican accent in, you know, and Irish to boot, for that matter, but, but uh, just a very meaningful relationship. And um, and I, I I'm, I'll be eternally grateful to him for manifesting to me not just the truth of Catholicism in books or from the Catechism, but by making it real in a human life by manifesting all that learning, all that theology, 
but 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 coloring it, covering the whole thing over with charity, and that that is that, that's the heart and soul of the Catholic faith. Like all the learning in the world does you nothing if you can't actually be present to another human per, human being in their deep humanity, and uh, and so it's a just a deep pleasure for me to know anyone who's ever crossed his path, and even better if they crossed his path because of anything that I had to do with it and all the lives that he touched. So uh, pray for the repose of the soul of Father Lambert, and Father Lambert, pray for all of us. And, uh, and I'm so happy to hear about these people that have come into the church and to know that Call to Communion and Casa Maria and EWTN had anything to do with it. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. We head next to Dayton, Ohio. Pat is a first-time caller listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Pat, you're on with Dr. David Andrews. Hey, great. Thanks for taking my call. And uh, my question is... Uh, I'm a Catholic, and I had lunch with a real good friend who's an ex-Catholic. And he quoted a survey that said nine out of ten Catholics thought that priests should be allowed to be married. Well, I disputed it and didn't really want to argue about it, so we quit the conversation there. But I did research it, and it, I guess that priests were allowed to be married until about 1100 or so. And I'm just wondering what changed to make them uh, not be allowed to be married? And does the Dr. Anders think that perhaps at some point in time, given the situation of uh, not a lot of priests, that it would ever go back to allowing priests to be married? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the question. So uh, as you might expect, the answer is far more nuanced than, than, than the way the question has framed it. Um, it's not precisely true to say that priests were allowed to marry and then they weren't. Um, th- there's always been a preference for a celibate priesthood in the Catholic Church, East and West, because Christ himself, of course, was celibate, St. Paul was celibate, and they both commended that form of consecration as the most perfect way. Jesus spoke of those who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Paul talks about it being better than a man not to bear, not marry so that he can give himself to the, to the work of the ministry. And, uh, and what's always been the case, whether married or not, is that if a married man is ordained— and his wife dies, he can't marry a second time. And so, that, again, that, that preference for, you know, you may have come into the faith in one state of life, uh, but if your state of life changes and it becomes a celibate state of life, then, you're, then you, you, you must live that consecration if you're a priest. You have to stay celibate and single if you're a priest and your wife dies. That's why Paul says in more than one place that the, the bishop or the priest has to be the husband of but one wife. Can't have two wives, can't have three, the husband of but one wife. Um, so no, no consecutive marriages there if you're a priest. And so there, there are still married Catholic priests in the Church today. The Eastern Rites of the Church have, uh, have quite a few, and there's a few stragglers in the Western and the Latin Rite as well. But the rule for them is the same as it's always been, which is that if their spouse dies, that's it. One and done, they, they can't marry again. Um, and, uh, and, and there are, like I said, there are uh, converts, particularly from Anglicanism, into the Catholic Church today that are allowed to be ordained priests even though they're married. So the, the ban on, on marriage is not an absolute ban, uh, never has been. But as we said, there is a strong, there's a strong preference for the celibate priesthood uh, because of those biblical arguments that we have already made. Now, um, in, in terms of the situation in the 11th century, the, the issue wasn't so much marriage as it was concubinage, right? So there's, there's always been a problem uh, because of human nature with priests and lay people, for that matter, not following uh, the full uh, Catholic moral teaching on human sexuality. And so you, you did have a big problem with priests that were taking concubines and, and lovers, and there was a, a very strong movement in the 11th century to crack down on that and to go back to celibacy for the priesthood as the ideal. And, and that whole movement strengthened the what would ultimately become the canonical position universally on Latin Rite priests, which is that they are they're overwhelmingly not to be married when they're ordained. Uh, and so that's the predominant practice in the West. But like I said, the story is a bit more nuanced than, than the way your friend put it. When it comes to the survey results, um, I mean, there's a whole industry of, um, of collecting survey data that purports to show that the run-of-the-mill Catholic does not agree with the church's teaching on some issue, with its policy on some issue. And I, I have a friend who's a Catholic sociologist, um, well, so I'd say put him on the left side of the political and theological spectrum, who really literally has made a career out of publishing books uh, purporting to show just that, that most Catholics disagree with the church on this, that, or the other thing. And there's more than one way to take that data. 
uh, the way he takes it and the way some ideologues take it is to suggest that the Catholic Church needs to change its teaching to bring it in line with popular opinion. That's, that's one way to take that kind of data. Um, another way to take the data is that it's the popular opinion that needs to be brought in line with the teaching of the, the, the magisterium. Um, and, and beyond that, you typically find when you do survey data of this kind that w you can break it down demographically and find very different responses depending on what kind of Catholic you're asking. So if you ask, if you survey Catholics who go to Mass every week, Catholics who go to Mass every week and confession at least once a year, do you agree with the church's teaching on X, Y, Z, P, D, or Q? And overwhelmingly, they will agree. If you ask people who identify as Catholic but never darken the door of a Catholic church, do you agree with the church on, you know, X, Y, Z, P, D, Q? They will overwhelmingly disagree. That should not surprise people, that dynamic. Uh, and it hardly counts as a sort of ringing condemnation of the church's position on a particular issue if the most disaffected and the least attached uh, have the least attachment to Catholic doctrine. And, you know, the reasons that people disaffiliate, there are all kinds of reasons that people disaffiliate. Um, objection to Catholic doctrine is actually fairly small on the list. If you, if you survey people who have left Catholicism about why they leave, a flat-out disagreement with Catholic doctrine rarely ranks high on the list. It, it usually is more an interpersonal dynamic or a sense of, you know, spiritual fulfillment or lack thereof, but it is rarely boils down to, you know, I disagree with this or that teaching. So that's what I have to say. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. Be sure to join us for Fire on Earth Monday through Friday morning at 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time. This week, Peter Herbeck provides a compelling look at the essence of Christianity, and he takes a deeper dive into the teachings of St. John and his gospel. Peter's insights will help Catholics acquire the tools they need to do their part in the new evangelization. That's Fire on Earth, Monday through Friday, 5.15 a.m. Eastern Time. Next up is Jennifer in Libertyville, Illinois, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Jennifer, you're on with Dr. David Anders. Hi, doctor. Thank you for taking my call. And I just want to talk a little bit about, number one, this is, I've only been listening to this station for a few like a week and a half maybe, and I've just come upon your show today as I was driving, um, learning some interesting things. I'm not a Catholic. I grew up Catholic, but left that um, form of Christianity. And the other day I was listening to one of the um, programs that were on the air, and they talked about heaven and how we know um, – Mary is in heaven, or so they say, and I'm wondering, because then purgatory came up, and it's praying for all these souls in purgatory, can you help me understand purgatory versus heaven, and if the Catholic Church claims that heaven is only after Jesus comes back, how does that work? Yeah, sure. If uh, great question. Really appreciate it. And so first of all, a couple things. I, I really appreciate your calling. I absolutely love people who have only been listening to the show for a week and a half. That's fantastic, and uh, or the station for a week and a half. And I think it's just beyond fantastic. It makes my whole day when someone who's just tuned in in their car radio uh, picks up the phone and makes a phone call. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the call. Uh, God bless you. Secondly, um, you're from Libertyville. I, I, you're very close to my old stomping grounds. Um, I'm a convert to Catholicism myself, and I did my undergraduate work at Wheaton College in Illinois, Wheaton, Illinois, I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, and then my seminary degree at Trinity Divinity School in, in Deerfield. So I, I, you know, you're calling from my own home base, you know, back there in, uh, in the western suburbs of Chicago. So thanks uh, so much. I really, it's really great to hear from you. Uh, when it comes to the Catholic doctrine of heaven, how that relates to purgatory, uh, where do we place heaven in terms of uh, Christ's second coming? First of all, what is heaven? What is the reward of the just? What are we looking forward to when we talk about going to heaven, when we die? Uh, the Catholic position I find personally so beautiful. Um, you know, St. Paul says that now we see through a glass darkly, then we will see clearly face to face. Uh, St. John says that we'll be like him when we see him. Um, so the idea of a kind of experience of God that is personally transformative to us, it changes our character um, and, uh, and, and penetrates our consciousness. And the Catholic understanding of God is that God is not just a being, a, you know, a great big being among a bunch of small beings. 
God is actually the source of all being itself. And so in God is all the, the, the source and origin of everything true, good, and beautiful. And so to, to confront God is, is to confront literally that which makes all good things good, that which makes all beautiful things beautiful, that which makes all true things true. And so whatever particular good you like, you know, say you like apples, for example. Well, everything that you ever liked good about an apple is virtually in God because it all came from him as the source. Same thing with your favorite piece of music, with the most beautiful sunset you ever saw. All of that is realizable in God, but infinitely. And when we talk about seeing God, we're not talking about seeing God with our eyes, because, of course, God has no body. It doesn't reflect light. Um, we're, the Catholic position is that this is, this is an immediate, intuitive knowledge, or experience, if you will, of God in his essence— that is a union of our will and intellect with the infinite source of all blessedness, truth, good, goodness, and beauty. Uh, it, is, it is literally beyond imagining the glories and the wonders and the joys and the exaltations of the life of heaven. It is, it is a far cry from, you know, fat baby angels with, with harpsichords, or not harpsichords, but harps, uh, sitting on clouds, or people, you know, sitting around singing Charles Wesley hymns for all eternity, even though I'm very fond of Charles Wesley hymns, not, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's vastly, vastly more compelling than that. Um, and that, according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, that experience of the vision of God is available to anybody immediately upon death. Immediately upon death, they can have that experience if they die purified of sin and, and penetrated by the love of God. You know, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 24, Who can ascend the Lord's mountain or stand on his holy hill? Only he who has clean hands and a pure heart. So if one is pure of heart, then at the moment of death, they can immediately enter into that, we, we call it the beatific vision, that, that beautiful, beautifying vision of God, immediately. Now, one thing about dying is that you will be deprived of your body. So that a vision of God that takes place immediately after death for the just is a spiritual vision that doesn't involve physical eyes. But we know that when Christ comes back, there'll be a resurrection of the body. And so those very same souls will get their bodies back and have an embodied experience, but, it, but, the, but the embodiment will not take anything away from that beatific vision, but will add to it. And so they will continue to experience the infinite blessedness of God in their souls. But now they will also extensively be able to experience the material universe with that same degree of glory. And so, you know, it, it, the whole of creation will be transformed and everything will be resplendent and beautiful. So you'll have uh, that physical participation of the created world that, that God made. Uh, now, what about purgatory? Well, the Catholic position is that if you die in God's grace, if you die forgiven, if you die a believer, if you die with the love of God in your heart, and yet you don't have that full purity of heart necessary for the vision of God, then you get to go, as it were, to heaven's antechamber. And of course, speaking of chambers is entirely metaphorical. Um, we don't mean a literal physical location. Uh, but, a, but a mode of preparation where that purification is given to us and we come to be able to see that full vision of God in its entirety. On behalf of our host, Dr. David Anders, our producer, Charles Beery, call screener Matt Gubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Person. I'm Jack Williams sitting in today for Tom Price. We're asking that question as we do every day, what's stopping you from becoming a Catholic? Thanks for tuning in. This is EWTN's Call to Communion with Dr. David Anders.